My last question, um, there's actually two more. Hopefully we can get through this, inshallah. What should um, Islamic communities expect from students the knowledge upon their graduation and repatriation, which means to return back to their country of origin? Um, and how have the previous expectations, if there were any at all, of graduating students, have they been too low, such that many have come home and not contributed much to, with respect to changing the condition of our communities? So what should the expectation of Islamic communities be regarding students of knowledge who graduate and repatriate back to their communities? What should be our expectation? What should we expect from students of knowledge who return home? Should they grab a book or Surah Thadath and start saying, well, the Sheikh is saying here, or well, the Sheikh is saying here, and what the Sheikh is, means here, is that what a student of knowledge should be doing? Because many of us don't know what our expectations of graduates, of students of knowledge should be. So we allow them to come home, come back into the communities, and they grab a small metin, they grab a small you know, text, and they, off they go teaching, and we say, oh, we got a student of knowledge in our community, and his presence is no different than his absence. His presence is no more beneficial than his absence. That's the question, inshallah, to Adam. Uh, he has to change. You got to change the... Go ahead. We ran our 80, 80 minutes. So we're on our second set of 80 minutes. No, alhamdulillah. Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah ta'ala, said that when Abu Zara'a used to pass through Khurasan, kunna natajannab qiyamul layl. He said when Abu Zura'a, the great scholar, would pass through Khurasan, through the area of Iraq, we wouldn't even pray to Hajju, because we would benefit from him for the time that he was with us. Amen. So if you have regular plans for the night, you're here for the rest of the <laughs> Abu Zura'a is here. Um, so that's the question, inshallah ta'ala, and I'll leave it to um, the imams and students to answer that. And let me begin by saying that um, I see a lot of people in the crowd when I came in who are older, some older than me, alhamdulillah. And uh, based upon what my uh, beloved brother Mufti mentioned about uh, the people of 2017 being a different breed, that is true. The sunnah of the Prophet is that there always has to be this process of passing off the baton. It has to be. If you don't have that in your community, there's a problem. And everybody has it. We are the few people, we're probably the only species of people, we don't have that thing of even respecting our elders. We have disrespect for elders. So when Bilal Phillips was on the scene, he was like my elder, and Bilal Phillips was refuting the Ansar law cult. He was writing. He was a prolific writer. Uh, that book, Kitab al Tawheed, things that he did. Yeah. And he was spreading the Sunnah. He was spreading the Sunnah. But yet he turned into something that uh, was unfair and unjust. I say that to say a lot of these brothers and other these brothers, even some from the other side. Uh, one thing that I always tried to do was to give these brothers love, always, always. I remember there was some drama and some beef between one of the famous imams in East Orange, New Jersey, Abu Muslima. We had some problems with a couple of brothers back then, before it really got intense. I would give a lecture in East Orange, New Jersey, and in front of the people, I would say, so-and-so is a good student. You brothers should try to be like so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. I didn't know Mufti that well. I knew this one brother on the other side. And I used to say that because I wasn't afraid of the ramifications of that. And I wanted to always be a person who was trying to get along with the brothers. And I didn't think that all the drama was warranted, but it became what it has become. But I'm happy to say once again, from the ni'mah of Allah, I never was one of those people who had like this thing about 
the up and coming brothers or something to be feared. Because it doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. Which brings us right into this issue of what should we expect from people graduating the du'at and all of that kind of stuff. And a lot of stuff can be said about that, but I think we have to be realistic first and foremost. We have to be realistic. We have to be realistic and understanding that everybody is not a speaker. Even from the ulama, a Shaykh ibn Uthaymin, rahmatullahi alayhi, he wasn't the best orator. His classes were beneficial. But when he gave a khutbah, he wasn't the type of person who, for me personally, would inspire me like people were lesser than him in degrees because that wasn't his forte in terms of inspiring me anyway. So not everybody is going to be a khati, not everybody is going to be a speaker. He may be a researcher, the other one may be doing something that is going to be more in line with his skill set. And that's an ayat of the Qur'an. Everybody has his path that he's been put on. So follow your path. Follow your path. So this brother, he has the Magdiya show. This brother over here, he's doing whatever he's doing. You're the Mu'evin. You're the cat who always is fasting on Mondays and Thursdays. You're the elder dude of the community. And you over there, you're the security and on and on. Just get in where you fit in and do your thing. So to think that every student that comes back is qualified or competent to even be an imam, that's not true. I knew students. I knew students from America. They got caught smoking weed in Medina. Dude came back and he was smoking weed in Medina from Chicago. <laughs> he got kicked out. That's not for you now and look on that. That's not for you to go and look for who was studying Medina from Chicago. <laughs> no, but I know worse than that. I know some students who didn't get up for Salat. They didn't get up for Fajr. I knew people like that. They didn't get up for Salat and Fajr. So my point is to be unrealistic and to think that everyone who graduates, that is a stamp that this person is qualified to give fatwas, qualified to, no. You have to look and identify what are the reality, what's the reality of a person's skill set. Another issue in terms of the reality of the situation and knowing where everybody, uh, what his job is and, and, and where we fit in, uh, this thing is a double-edged sword. Because on one hand, having the job as the Imam or an Imam. Someone of the panel said that the Imam is underpaid and he's overworked. Underpaid and he's overworked. And that's a reality for some people. And before I forget, because this just came to my mind, because someone said it, I think we have to, we have, we have to uh, pay homage right now. Some of you were laughing with loud voices. And I'm thinking, is this appropriate or not appropriate? Because when I came into the room, people were giving me love. And Ali Saber bumped into me like the Negro that he is from Detroit. He bumped into me. And I looked around thinking that some of the other side were here. Like, he was just joking with me. But when I came in, I realized I was disturbing the Darus of Mufti. I realized that. I was sensitive to that. Because when I'm teaching, I don't want people passing out water like this brother just did. I don't want people eating cookies and stuff. That gets into my central nervous system, and while teaching, I'll go off. Not crazy, but I, because that's from the etiquette. The companions used to sit and they said, if a bird landed on their shoulder, that bird, they, that, that's how still they were. So the Majlis, it has and it requires a level of edip. So I, I apologize to him for that. I was sensitive to the laughing that was going on. But I said, nah, nah. In the context of what this is all about, this is cool and this is our people, in my opinion, which brought this issue that I gotta bring to the table right now because we'd be remiss if we close this out without saying this. When our brother, Abu Abdul Razak Tahir Wyatt um, got accepted uh, to have a chair in the Prophet's mosque, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I went on record to publicly say 
I support that. Not only do I support that, but I said, Tahir is a lesson and an ayat from the ayat of Allah for our children, like my little nephews who came up to me from Cincinnati, from Ohio. These little, these little shorties that's up in the spot. Tahir Wyatt proved to these kids, yo, the sky is the limit by the Lord of the Kaaba, inshallah. So I think we have to go on record publicly saying and acknowledging amongst ourselves, amongst ourselves, that that brother got his PhD and he did very well. He did exceptionally well. But in doing well, we got to be realistic. Does that mean he's Sheikh al-Islam when he comes back to this joint? <laughs> Does it mean that? Nope. He's Sheikh al-Islam? And this thing about loving ourselves, loving ourselves, for someone to conflate being proud to be African-American, to someone to conflate that and confuse that with you being racist. You know, you could be a racist, but you have to make it clear. I never believed like some of the people who preceded us to Islam from Jamaat to Tablid, they started speaking, and I'm not bashing you if that's your flex. People from Jamaat to Tablid were speaking with a Pakistani accent, brother, brother. And I never believed that I had to do that. I never believed that I had to do that. So now that that brother has accomplished what he accomplished, it's a responsibility. Let's take that brother as the apex in terms of the question. We have to figure out, based upon his past, where he's at, where he's going, where he's going to be, whatever community he comes to. Maybe he has to go to a community that unfortunately our reality may be we can't afford that door. Because we've been lunching for 20 years, we can't afford them. But whatever the reality is, he goes to one of them Desi communities, Pakistani brothers or something like that, just so that he could feed his family. I ain't hating him for that. I ain't against that. He gotta take care of his family. But still, we're gonna try to utilize, we're gonna try to utilize that brother to help our situation to the best of our ability. But for us to hate on him because he went there, Part of the issue is part of our problem, what has happened all of these last 20 years. So in terms of responsibility, in terms of what's the responsibility? How should we be looking at this situation? I think at the top of the list, we just have to be realistic about the people who go out, go over and study and coming back and then see what needs to be done. To look at the person that we had that um, Mahdi Minhaj, the Mahdi and Muntalva. We're waiting for the Mahdi to come and solve all of the problems. Because when the Mahdi comes back, all of this drama in the earth, Trump, Iraq, all of this drama, he's gonna fill the earth with justice just as it has been filled with all of this oppression. So we're gonna wait for the student to come back and he has all the answers. That's crazy, that's insane, that's insanity. He is not physically, mentally, spiritually capable of doing all of that. He has his niche, he's responsible for it. We have to acknowledge that, which brings me to the end of what I have to say in this regard. Thus, the light is shed upon the importance of unity. Unity. And unity is not necessarily us being together like this in one room all again, but it's him doing his job and not conflicting with mine and him doing his job and not conflicting with his, because in reality, all of our jobs are the same, but no single man can be on every ship that's leaving the dock. It's impossible, it's impossible. So in closing, uh, Abu Zubair had mentioned about this thing about our, um, loving the spotlight and hating and jealousy. You guys were laughing, but it's as real as real gets. It's the culture that we're coming in, the hip hop culture. And with these millenniums, our kids, it even becomes even more, more stamped in their psyche. I think everybody here heard of Sufyan Athori, one of the 10 people considered Amir al-Mu'minin in Hadith. This man is on another level at his own medhat. He said that the biggest jihad that he had to make was jihad against that thing of people looking at him coming from all over the world to meet this man. And if that's the case with him, if that's the case with him, <laughs> what do you think is the case with people like us? Who sometimes, we didn't always have tarbiyah, we didn't always have that upbringing where, you know, it's going to be 
a bigger possibility. So it is an issue that is definitely there. So I would say, you just have to be realistic as it relates to people who are coming back. Don't expect too much, what's beyond people's ability. And at the same time, don't think, like in our audience right now, we have brothers, we have sisters, who are teachers, Islamic teachers, Islamic teachers, getting only a fraction of the salary that non-Muslims are getting for various reasons. Is it realistic to expect a guy, a, mom, a girl, a lady, a man, to work in a school for peanuts and they have to do all of that jihad of dealing with those kids? It's just not, it's just, it's just not right. So you're basically you're saying that the expectation shouldn't be too high and shouldn't be too It low. should be realistic. Realistic. Just it should be realistic.